good. So, before we open God's Word together, let's, let's pray. Good morning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're so thankful that we have the opportunity to come and worship you. And Lord, we are uh, a needy people and pray that as we open up your word that you, Holy Spirit, would teach us. Lord, as we read your word together, Holy Spirit, would pray that you would win lost people, that you would build believers, that you would equip workers. Lord, I, we need you. That's why we're here. I, our nation needs you. And so we pray that you would revive us. Will you not yourself revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. May we be revived through this time together. And Lord, may we go out and share with others. And, and may a revival in your church lead to a great spiritual awakening in our land. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you're new, we're reading through a book in the Bible together, studying it. It's called Colossians. If you have your Bible, turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible, it would help, be helpful to bring a Bible. And if you don't have one, we have some in the lobby. You could pick one up. We believe the Bible is God's Word. We love to open it up and come and see Jesus together. So in Colossians 2, 6, and 7... Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. On Tuesday, on Tuesday at 2.22, or on 2.22, 22, at 2.22 in the afternoon, I officiated a wedding, and uh, that's pretty good, right? Tuesday, 2.22, at 2.22, and listen, the bride was so beautiful, and the groom was so handsome, and they were so in love, and um, then I thought, how many couples, that's how they start, right? Right? They're so in love on their wedding day, and then the love begins to fade. Isn't that sad? A Chinese lady told my mom once, this was so good. She said, the problem in America is when a couple gets married, the teapot is whistling, and they take it off the stove so that it cools off over time. She says, in China... When someone gets married, that's when they put the teapot on the stove so that over the course of 10 or 20 years, then it's really whistling. I mean, if you're married like me, I've been married for a long time. I am so much more in love with my wife today than I was when I got married because she's put up with me for so long, right? And you know, it's just like that with Jesus too. It's just like that with Jesus, too. Many people tell me, you know, Smiley, the best day of my life was the day I met Jesus. And that's pretty good, isn't it? Because it could be much worse than that, right? But shouldn't we say, today is the best day of my life? Because I have walked with Jesus so long, and I am so much more aware now that I am a sinner. I am so much more overwhelmed now by what a great Savior we have. That's what I long for you, that every day you walk with Jesus is greater than the day before because your appreciation for him and all that he has and is and will do is growing in your life. Wouldn't that be a good place to be? Now, here's how we get there. The point of today's message, what we're going to learn is that everyone needs the gospel every day. I mean, the word gospel means good news. Wouldn't it be great to have good news every day? Everyone needs the gospel every day. That's what Paul's saying here. He says, as you receive Christ, so walk in him. Don't you remember? Don't you remember when you first heard the gospel? Don't you remember when it seemed too good to be true? That you could be forgiven? That you could live forever? That you could do life in eternity? with? Don't you remember? And he says, never forget. Never forget what it was like. Never forget how thrilled you were. Never, never, never forget. 
And so he's been teaching you, remember, remember Christ in you, the hope of glory. Remember, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Never forget Jesus. Uh, One of our core values as a church, one of our core values as a church is we're gospel-centered, which means the good news loves the gospel. By the way, if you didn't know, gospel means good news. That's why we're called good news, because we love the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel. The lost need the gospel to be reached while the found need the gospel to be transformed. Notice Romans 1. This is written to a church. Paul says, I can't wait to get to Rome so that I can encourage the church with the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, Looking at our point again, we're, we're going to start unpacking this, that everyone needs the gospel, okay? Everyone needs the gospel. Do you see that in verse 6? He says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. You see, don't you remember how you started? You heard the gospel, right? So walk in him, so we continue to walk in the power of the gospel. Notice as well, it says the Christian life begins when we receive Christ Jesus the Lord So I want you to know there's the gospel. The gospel says the problem is inside of us, the problem's in us, and the solution's outside of us. The problem's in us, the solution's outside of us. Do you know that's the opposite of our culture, isn't it? Our culture says what the problem is outside of us, and the solution is inside of us. Just follow your heart, right? What people used to say is the problem is is ignorance. It's outside of us. And if we just educate people, it will lead to human flourishing. Uh, Is that true? Um, uh, Or or it used to be that all our problems come from poverty. So if you just just give people a job or money, that'll solve our problems, right? But how do we hear it today? How do we hear that today? Don't we hear defund the police? And and I'm not saying the police aren't ever wrong. Sometimes they are. But but the idea that the problem is out there, that if we just get rid of the police, it would lead to what? It would lead to human flourishing. The inner goodness would just flourish. Don't we hear, if if we just change the name of buildings, if if we just tear down statues, that will lead to human flourishing, right? But the gospel says some of those things might be good ideas, but the problem is inside us. And the solution is outside of us, right? Oh, haven't you been enjoying walking through Mark? And I was reminded of this when we were in Mark chapter 7. Um, and, and he was saying that which proceeds out of the man is, is what defile, that is what defiles a man. A lot of people then were very concerned about what they ate. You know anybody like that today? But what Jesus says, it, it's not what goes into us that defiles us, it's what comes out. And I want you to know, if that's true, I'm in trouble. Aren't you? The things that come out of my mouth? You see, Jesus says what comes out of the mouth reveals the heart, and my heart's a meth, mess. That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. Uh, next verse, look, look at this. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts. I mean, you ever look around the world and wonder why it's so broken? The problem is inside of us. It's inside all of us. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. Now think about this. This is what people were like 2,000 years ago. What are people like today? So obviously what? The problem is inside of us and not outside of us because human nature hasn't changed, has it? The problem is in us. You say, well, Smiley, why are you a Christian? I'm a Christian because the gospel is true. Yes, the Bible teaches it, and that's the standard of truth, but the evidence of truth is does this verse explain the world we live in? Does it? I mean, any of you parents, any of you parents, did you ever have to teach your kids to be selfish? Did you ever have to teach them to say, mine? Did you ever have to teach them to lie or steal? They just, they somehow what they knew how, right? You know why? Because it comes from within. The Bible says that we're all sinners. And we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Listen, 
Evil comes from within. Because we are sinners, we commit crime after crime against God, right? Uh, coveting, wickedness, sensuality, envy, slander, pride. It all comes from within. And because we've sinned against God, we're in big trouble. The Bible says what we deserve is hell. So if the problem is inside of us, the gospel teaches that the solution is outside of us, right? So we go back to Colossians 2, and uh, notice what he says. As you have received Christ, Jesus the Lord. Did you know that Christ is not Jesus' last name? You knew that, right? Uh, Christ is a title. Christ is a title. It means Messiah. It means anointed one. So each word here is significant. Christ means Messiah, anointed one. Jesus means Savior. That you receive the anointed one, Savior, the Lord. You see, the good news is not about what we do for God, but what he's done for us. That Christ Jesus, the Lord, that, that God the Son left heaven, came to earth, and then uh, lived a perfect life for us, went to the cross, died for our sins, paying in full the penalty for our sins. He was buried, but the third day he rose from the grave and he offers eternal life to all who would receive Christ, who would receive him as Savior and Lord. He offers to forgive us. He offers us the chance to do life with him. He offers us the chance to do eternity with him. And our part is to receive Christ Jesus the Lord. Doesn't the Bible teach that over and over again? In John chapter 1, but as many as received him, have you received him? If you haven't, wouldn't you like to? You, you could be forgiven. You could do life and eternity with Jesus by receiving Christ as Savior and Lord. We admit to him, Lord, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry, won't you? We believe, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And then we trust him as Savior. Forgive me. Give me eternal life. Trust him as Lord, won't you? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Well, when we believe... Not only are we forgiven, not only do we get to do life and eternity with God, but we become God's children. That's how the Christian life begins. When we hear the gospel, the bad news, and the good news, and then we receive Christ. Have you? I mean, Revelation 3.20, same theme, isn't it? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that Jesus pursues us. I want to forgive you. Let's do life together. Let's do eternity together. We hear, right? And then we receive him. Jesus, come in and be my Savior and Lord. And notice what he says. I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus moves in. We're forgiven. We get to do life with Jesus. We get to do eternity with Jesus, right? Listen, everyone needs the gospel. Everyone needs the gospel. I was at a funeral uh, recently and. I was not officiating at it, and, and, and the pastor who was speaking, uh, <clears throat> at the end of the service, he gave people an opportunity to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, and, and I really appreciated that, but he never shared the bad news. He never talked about sin. He never shared the good news. He never shared about who Jesus is and what he had done for us. He, he simply invited people to respond. And listen, Jesus can use anything to draw people to himself. But I was there thinking the lost people in the room really needed to hear the gospel. They needed to hear the bad news of sin. They needed to hear the good news that Jesus died in rose. They needed to hear our part is to receive him. But the believers in the room the believers in the room needed to hear the gospel. I did. You want to know why? Because everybody got up during the service and talked about how wonderful this lady was. And she was how wonderful she was. And you would have thought she got to go to heaven because she was good. And if you have to be good to go to heaven, I'm sitting in the room thinking, I don't stand a chance. I don't stand a chance. I needed to hear the reason she was in heaven is not because she was good, but she was like me. She too was a sinner. She too believed in Jesus. And that's why we knew where she was. I needed to hear that. Don't you? I mean, if only good people go to heaven, what are the rest of us going to do, right? Listen, everyone needs to hear the gospel. We need to hear the problems inside of us. It's inside of all of us. And the solution is outside of us, right? We all need Jesus. 
So coming back to our point, we explored the first part that everyone needs the gospel, but, but now we get to every day, every day. <clears throat> Going back to verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, remember, remember what it was like. Remember, so walk in him. Listen, if you're married, remember, remember that day. Remember when you were all dressed up? Remember how you were so in love? Remember that? Remember, walk in light of that. Walk in light. Don't forget that. Oh. Remember? Remember when you met Jesus? Oh, man. I remember like it was yesterday. I couldn't believe Jesus loved me. I couldn't believe that I could be forgiven for what I've done, that I could do life and eternity with Jesus. I remember saying, Jesus, come in. And you know what happened? My heart was filled with a love for Jesus. I love Jesus. Didn't you? I, I had a love for one another. I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be around God's people. I had a love for lost people. I really did. I had so many friends that I wanted to bring to Jesus. Didn't you? Paul says, don't lose that. As you received him, remember how thrilled you were with the gospel, so walk in him. Listen, we need the gospel every day to remember. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, we don't move on from the gospel, but we learn how the gospel is what keeps us in love with Jesus and keeps us in love with one another and the lost. Oh, and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See the word gratitude? The, the Greek word there is Eucharist. Uh, you, we're going to come to the Lord's Supper in a little bit, right? And in Anglican churches and other churches, you know what they call the Lord's Supper? The, the Eucharist, right? The giving thanks. The reason we need to hear the gospel every day, the reason everyone needs the gospel every day is so that we never lose our first love. We never lose our first love. And what I mean by that is we never, we never lose our get-tos and they become have-tos. That we never lose our get-tos and they become have that's, that's when you lose your first love, is when get-tos become have-tos. How often I hear people saying, Smiley, do I have to? And I always say, if you're a Christian, you don't have to do anything. You don't. But oh man, we get to. We get to. You know what we get to? We get to love Jesus. We get to love Jesus. And you know why we get to love Jesus? Because he first loved us. Oh, I love in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. You know why I love Jesus? Because he first loved me, don't you? Listen, we get to love Jesus. Oh, I... Had such a good time walking through Mark, haven't you? Being reminded how much he loves us so that we want to love him. Remember back in Mark 1, remember back in Mark 1, Jesus calls, he calls Peter and Andrew, James and John, and, and he calls them, and, and then he takes them on a fishing trip into a synagogue. He shows us how to fish for religious people. And then he takes them, he goes into Peter's uh, home to show them how to fish for family. And Mark 1, 29, and immediately, Mark's favorite word, right? And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And next verse, now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. Now, I could tell some mother-in-law jokes, but my mother-in-law lives with me. But I, but I must say, Peter must have really loved his mother-in-law, right? Because he wanted Jesus to what? To heal her, right? So Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her, and he raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. <laughs> Do you know how Americans read that? Oh, sexist, right? The woman has to get up and what? And wait on the men. But that's not how we read it. Do you know when you love to wait on others? Do you know when? When the moment before you couldn't. The moment before she was unable to wait. She was sick. She was sick. And Jesus 
healed her. And she said, I get to wait on others. I can't believe I get to do this. That's our story. We had the sin disease. We had the death disease. One moment, and then Jesus healed us, and we get to love Jesus. We get to follow Jesus. We get to wait on him, right? Because he first loved us, right? You keep reading. There's, in Mark 2, we get to another man, and this man is guilty and paralyzed. He's guilty and paralyzed. He has some friends. His friends bring him to Jesus. You know, you, you know the story. They lower him down, and Jesus says, you're forgiven. And uh, the people say, who can forgive sins? Now, notice what Jesus says. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, <clears throat> next verse, he said, I say to you, pick up your pallet and go home. The really big deal was this man was forgiven. And what Jesus says is, so that you may know that this man is forgiven, I'm going to heal him. And, and so I say the paralytic, get up and pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let me ask you, when are you excited? When are you excited about carrying your pallet? When? When a moment before you were carried in. And you were healed. And now, now you could carry your own pallet. The people were amazed. They saw him come in one. They saw him leave another way. Isn't that our story? The Bible says we were what? We were dead. And Jesus raised us from the dead. That we were paralyzed. Those in the flesh cannot please God. We were raised from the dead. Now we can follow him. Do people around us, do they see, are they amazed at how they see Jesus changing us? We get to love him. We get to follow him. He raised us from the dead. He healed us, right? Oh, man. One more story. Uh, Jesus is going along and same chapter and he comes to Matthew, he's called Levi in the story, and he's a tax collector. Very rich, but materially rich, but relationally poor. Everybody hated him. He was a tax collector. And um, look at what changed his life. And Jesus went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Jesus said, Matthew, let's do life together. Let's do eternity together. Let's be friends. And what did he do, man? He left everything to follow Jesus. Man, that's my story. Is that your story? Man, one day, Jesus found me. And Jesus said, follow me. Are you kidding me? Who wouldn't want to leave everything to follow Jesus, right? I mean, isn't that our story? My verse, my verse, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Doesn't Jesus come to us, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Behold, I stand at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. What would our lives look like if we believed Jesus had moved in? When Sunday comes, would we say, do we have to worship? Oh, You ever think of what your worship means to Jesus? So many things in the world break his heart. But we dine at the table with him and say, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jesus, we get a chance to have breakfast with him every morning. I mean, you ever think of what it means to him? He pursued you. He said, let's be friends. He's sitting at the table. How many of us are so busy we don't have time to have breakfast with Jesus? I mean, come on. If we were walking by the table and Jesus was sitting at the table, wouldn't we spend time with him? Wouldn't we say, thank you? Wouldn't we say, teach us? I mean, you know who's moved in, right? You do know, don't you? 
we learned a lot last, last week, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We can have breakfast with the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And when he says to us at the breakfast table, follow me, who wouldn't want to? Who would we get to follow Jesus, right? Why? Because he first loved us, right? Oh, man, I hear so many do I have tos. Oh, we get to love Jesus. We get to love one another. Our passage says when we take the gospel and press it down deep in our lives, we overflow with gratitude. The, the First John says when we understand how much he loves us, we love him. We love Jesus. We love one another. We get to love one another. One moment we couldn't. Then Jesus loved us. Now we can, right? Oh, John 13. John 13, Jesus' last night with his disciples. Do you know how the chapter begins? He loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. You know what I would love to be said about me as a husband? or a father, or a pastor. He loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. Wouldn't you like that to be true of you, wouldn't you? Listen, we have to be loved if we're going to be that, and Jesus has loved us. So Jesus looks around the room, and you know what he saw? He saw 12 proud hearts and 24 dirty feet. Sounds like your home, doesn't it? Sounds like your church, doesn't it? You're surrounded by difficult people to love. There's proud hearts and dirty feet. You know what Jesus did? He washed their feet. He washed Judas's feet. You know what's even more amazing? He washed my feet. If you're a Christian, he's washed your feet. Who ever heard? of God washing the feet of dirty sinners. But that's what he did, right? And so we get to, in John 13, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. <clears throat> if I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Listen, we can only love when we've been loved, right? And, and listen, Jesus has loved us, and we can only love to the extent that we've been loved. He's washed our feet. That's why we can, because he's loved us. And not only that, not only has he loved us, but he's gone first, and he says, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. He's shown us how, right? Oh, um, and then he tells us, Really, why we should truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. He says, you want more joy than you ever imagined? Just follow me, and I'll love you so you can love others. It's hard to love the people in our family sometimes, isn't it? You know what? Jesus says, run to me, and I'll wash your feet so you can wash your family's feet. Uh, we say, well, how do we do that? Jesus says, well, come, come and look at me. Spend time with me. I'll, I'll show you how to do it, right? We get to love one another because we've been loved. We get to love one another because Jesus shows us how. A little later in the same chapter, he, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Now, what enables us to do that? I mean, it's one thing to know we're supposed to love each other, but how do we do that? Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus says, I'll love you so you can love one another. Now, now, notice the word one another. People often say, well, Smiley, why don't you just say love God and love others? The reason is there's a new commandment here. We're called to love our neighbor, but whenever you see the word one another, he's talking about in the church. He's talking about in the church. He's saying a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. And, and, and then he says, even as I've loved you. And so if you're married, one another begins with your spouse or with your parents or with your children. That's where it begins. The new commandment is to love one another because that's family, right? That's one another. And then the church is the wider expression of that, the wider expression. Well, how do we do that? Jesus says, I'll love you so you can love your family. 
And then notice what he says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you don't smoke, if you don't cuss. Now, what is, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, what if you have love for one another? You know how I became a Christian? I was invited to Young Life, and when I walked in the room, there was love in the room. And I said, I don't know what these people have, but whatever they have, I want it. We have an opportunity in our homes and in our church to love one another the way Jesus has loved us so that the love-starved people in our county who encounter us say, wow, I don't know what those people have, but whatever they have, I want it. It's not that we have to love one another. We get to. We get to because we've been loved. We get to because we get to make Jesus visible and beautiful in our community by doing so. Um, We love Jesus because he first loved us. We love one another because he first loved us. We love lost people because he first loved us. We get to love lost people. We get to. One moment we couldn't, but the next minute we could because we experienced the life, the love of Jesus. Uh, Let me show you this in John 15. In John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. You know, I've finally come to understand that the NFL is not going to call. Uh, that Major League Soccer is not going to call my name. The NBA is not going to call my name. But someone wanted me on his team. Do you know I was involved in a self-destructive lifestyle, not only for me, but hurting the people around me? And one day Jesus said, I want you. He wanted me. No one else wanted me. And you know what he said? You're wasting your life. I want you to join me in changing the world one heart at a time. Listen, I get to do this. I get, Jesus wanted me. He, want, he chose you. You get to do this. He gives us the gospel. We understand what's broken with the world. It's inside us. We understand the solution is outside us. We're surrounded by people who don't know. And he's given us the gospel so that we might go and and share the gospel and, and, and make disciples who can make disciples, right? Everything Jesus asks us to do is impossible for us to do. That's why he says, so whatever you ask of the Father, my name, he may give to you. Lord, I'm a coward. Give me courage. Lord, I need your spirit. Lord, give me your spirit. Lord, open up an opportunity. Lord, give me the words to say. He says, whatever you need to carry out the mission, just ask. There has never been a better time to be a Christian than today. Everyone around us understands the world is broken, don't they? That's all that's talked about is how, what a mess the world is or our country is. And So this week, when... Ukraine comes up or our divided country comes up, why don't you just say, what do you think the problem is? What do you think the problem is? Do you, do you think the problem is outside of us or inside of us? Just ask and listen. If, if they ask you back, then be ready. You know what we learned in church on Sunday? We learn the problem is inside of us and the solution is outside of us. Would you like to hear more? And if they say no, you've done what you could, right? But if they say yes, you you could just pull out your little do-you-know booklet. You could read it to them because it says the problem's in us. It says the solution's outside of us. It invites people to respond. This week, this week when you're with lost people and they act like lost people, don't be surprised because guess what? Lost people act like lost people. They're lost. Remember, we love lost people, not because they're lovely. We love lost people because Jesus first loved us. Listen, when you're with lost people this week and and they have views that differ from you, maybe different political views or other things, listen, don't get upset with them. They're not your enemy. They're held captive by our enemy. And what we're called to do is to share the gospel with them and set them free. 
And you know why we can do that? We get to do that because he first loved us. Oh. Wow. <clears throat> Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. You begin with the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel to yourself over and over again. Everyone needs the gospel every day. Having been firmly rooted in the gospel and now being built up in him, really understanding the gospel, established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Listen, we get to love Jesus. We get to love one another. We get to love the lost. And so this week, this week, our action step for this week is what I want you to do is to apply the gospel to every area of your lives this week to apply the gospel to every area of your lives. When you think about Jesus, when you think about Jesus, I want you to think, we get to. We get to love Jesus. When Sunday comes, tell your heart, we get to worship. When the night of your small group meets, we get to. We get to gather and open his word together. When when, when you hear Jesus at the breakfast table in the morning, we get to have breakfast with Jesus. When Jesus says, follow me, follow me, we get to. I get to follow the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge who wouldn't want to follow him. We get to love one another. These are Jesus's brothers and sisters. He's loved us, so we can love one another. And and when we do love one another, we make Jesus visible in our community, and people will say, wow, that's what I'm looking for. Listen, we get to love lost people. We have exactly what they need, the gospel, to share with them the problems in us, the solutions outside of us. Wouldn't you like to know Jesus? Oh, man overflowing with gratitude. You know what I can't believe? I can't believe that we get to love Jesus. We get to love one another. We get to love the loss. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for loving us the farthest. Thank you for leaving heaven to come and seek and save sinners like me and like all of us. Listen, if, if for the first time you've understood the gospel and you've never received Jesus as Savior and Lord, won't you? He's here. Won't you say, Jesus, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. And I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And I want you to come in and forgive me. And give me eternal life and be my Savior. I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me, give, be the, help me be the, become the person you want me to be, won't you? If you have, won't you mark it on your card? We'd love to celebrate with you. And Jesus, I pray for those of us who've received you that today we would remember. We would remember what it was like when we first met you. And Lord, I pray that every day of our lives we would grow in our love for you and say, we get to love you. Lord, help us to love one another, that we get to love one another the way you've loved us. Lord, fill us with a love for lost people, that we get to love those around us and and share Christ with them. Thank you for this privilege. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.